just in case you don't know where Korea is, you are here. <laughs> it's really small if you think about it, right? It's not in the center of anything. It's not in the center of Europe or in the center of Asia. It's oh, way off on the side, way up north. Uh, but it is worth trying to figure out why it has been uh, so ge geopolitically important. As I'm sure Mary told you earlier, uh, Korea is interesting geographically because there's, there's a lot of things we say the most, the biggest, et cetera, in the world. But this is actually true. It's the only place in the world where the interests of the four major superpowers literally touch each other. And what I mean by that is, like, if you go to India or Iran or Iraq, USA is 10,000 miles away, Russia is 10,000, you know. Here, whoops, Korea shares land borders with Russia and China. Its closest relation uh, to Japan is 50 miles by ferry. And of course, as many of you know, the United States had at one time 100,000 troops and nuclear weapons on the peninsula. And now we have 30,000 troops. So the four biggest economies, the four biggest countries in the world are literally nose to nose on the Korean peninsula. Uh, but how many times did Japan and China invade Korea? Does anybody know? I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, the popular perception is that Korea has just been constantly invaded. We're the small country, the big countries do whatever they want. Uh, and I'm going to give you a different story, actually, and one that, one that shows a lot more stability in East Asia, which for those of you who do uh, world history or, or whatever else, is actually, I think, one of the most interesting things about East Asian history is how it actually worked, right? Because if we go to Europe, and we all know this, right, the history of Europe is a blood-soaked series of unending wars against each other. From the Hundred Years' War, the Seven Years' War, the, uh, you know, just on and on and on, right? Uh, Napoleon, Trafalgar, etc. In Europe, you had a bunch of similarly sized states, kingdoms, whatever, that spent centuries beating the uh, stuffing out of each other. Uh, and the best way to show this is if you put a map. So this is, this is Europe in 1300, and we have a whole bunch of political units here that don't exist anymore, right? So there's a King Crown of Castile, or Genoa and Savoy, Duchy of Guienne, whatever, right? Uh, a whole bunch of political units. And in fact, the, the Europe that we know today really didn't even begin to come into focus until the 19th century. So Europe by 1800 is beginning to look like Spain and Portugal, but you still have Sardinia, you still have Naples, the Kingdom of Naples, Torino, Helvetic Republic, the Ottoman Empire. So borders in Europe changed constantly as kingdoms rose and fell and people conquered each other and moved back and forth. The Europe that we know today is actually really recent. Now, in contrast, in, in, in East Asia, the four main states of East Asia, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and China, have basically existed for well over a thousand years. Their borders changed a little bit, but these are identifiably the same units. And so Korea became Korea around the seventh century. Now, there's a lot of historical uh, 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 debate over this, this kingdom called Goguryeo. But essentially, there were three kingdoms on the Korean peninsula. Before then, the uh, Baekje, Shilla, and Goguryeo, this Kaya was a, was a smaller thing. Uh, before then, around 200 AD, there were a bunch of little tribes, things back and forth. These kingdoms developed around 200, so that by 600 AD, you had basically three large kingdoms. Yamato, Japan, the Japanese state that we know today, it roughly traces its emergence to around the 6th or 7th century. Before then, again, just a bunch of little tribes or something. And, but there we can trace a political heritage. Now, the interesting thing is that here, there was a world war. There was a world war, meaning everybody who could be involved was involved. Uh, oops, right? So the Japanese allied with Baekje, Shilla allied with Tang, China. Uh, Shilla and Tang crushed Goguryeo. Uh, they then beat up Baekje, and the Japanese sent some troops. They sent them home. So there was a massive war, a couple decades. And when the dust settled, you basically had the, the beginnings of a unified 
Korean political unit, which covered two-thirds of the peninsula around 700 AD. And that political unit basically sort of pushed northwards so that by the 10th century, the border with China was this thing called the Yalu River. So you still have unified Shilla, uh, and it sort of pushed northwards. By the Choson dynasty of, 13, of 1400, they had basically filled out to what it looks like today, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit. East Asia has a very different historical sense of international relations, and what we would call is hierarchic, not equality, which sort of intuitively it wouldn't be. Why, why would you think that they're the same? They're not the same, <laughs> but rather a rank order. And the interesting thing is that in Europe, you had an idea of equality, formal equality, informal inequality, because of course there were some countries who were bigger, more powerful than others, and endless fighting. And in East Asia, you had formal hierarchy, formal ranking of countries. Informally, the big countries, China, left everybody alone. They didn't really interfere in South Korean or Korean domestic politics at all. So informal equality uh, and centuries of stability. Now, there were sort of two basic norms or practices. Uh, one is called investiture. Uh, and then the other was just cultural learning. And investiture was basically going through the motions of going to the Chinese emperor and saying, do you approve of me being king? So you send some, tr so you send some diplomats to China. The emperor says, of course you can be king. Here's a bunch of gifts. You go home. And the Chinese emperor leaves you alone. Right? Formally, you're saying, yeah, you're, you're an emperor. I'm only a king. But informally, the Chinese didn't care. They just wanted to make sure you understood where the rank order was. Also informally, of course, China at the time was the center of civilization and learning throughout that region. So in many very interesting ways, Koreans were happy to copy. So, um, and I, I have to remind my students that this actually isn't a real photo taken from the 12th century, um, <laughs> right? Uh, but language, up until the invention of the Korean alphabet, and even to this day, Koreans used Chinese characters to write. It was a sign of education, in fact, right? Even if you learned the Korean indigenous way of writing, which is much easier, precisely because it was a local indigenous way of writing, it was considered more educated and more sophisticated to be able to write in Chinese characters. And everybody around the region used them. Uh, there's an examination system. The best way to move up, again, this is very Confucian, education was the most important thing. Being a rich uh, 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 trader was not. But everybody wanted to be a student of the Confucian classics and get into the government service by passing the civil service exam. It was the only method for social mobility in Korea that, that was introduced. It's actually, I saw that downstairs. It was introduced roughly in the ninth century. And that was the way that everybody got to be successful. And it's one of the historical roots for why education is so important in Korea today. For centuries, that was the way to success. Being a trader wasn't. Being a general was not. There used to be a military exam along with the civil service exam. But it fell into disuse because the military wasn't being used a lot. The only difference is Korean insignia started at rank three. One is the highest. So the Chinese had one, two, three, four, whatever. The Koreans started at three. The highest rank you could get in Korea is three because they weren't going to be the Chinese, but they were using the same kind of a thing. Right? Now, what, what makes this so interesting is like, so, you know, so there, there's a set of ideas out there. There's a set of goals. As long as everybody knows where they fit, everything's fine. And a lot of cultural buying from, Korea, uh, from China. Now, there's indigenous Korean culture as well. Don't get me wrong. There's a deeply indigenous Korean culture, which is not Confucian, which is not hierarchic, which is earthy, egalitarian, and whatever else. And we're going to come back to this. So it wasn't a wholesale copying of Chinese culture any more than, for example, Mexico or Europe is borrowing wholesale from American culture. We're number one today, and people sort of like to borrow some stuff. Everyone wants to learn English. But that doesn't mean they all want to become American and act all like us. 
But the interesting thing about this, and, and, and I heard it again mentioned, is this war, because this is the exception that in some ways proves the rule. In 1592, in the Imjin Wedan, this Japanese general Hideyoshi decided he was going to invade China, and to get there he had to go through Korea. So, what did he do? He invaded, at one point it was almost 200,000 soldiers. They crossed, the, they crossed these 50 miles of water on 700 ships uh, and invaded Korea. Korea defended with 60,000 troops. Lee Sun Shin had turtle boats, mercilessly cut their supply lines. Uh, and the Chinese ultimately sent, at first they didn't believe the Koreans. Like, you're kidding me. The Japanese are invading us? <laughs> but eventually they sent troops and, and helped defend Korea. That was a world war also at the time. Now, what's interesting about this is about the same time, 1588, in Europe, there was the Spanish Armada. You guys have heard of that, right? The Spanish Armada has been called, let me make sure I get this right, right? The greatest military force ever assembled in Renaissance Europe when the Spanish tried to invade England. And they invaded with about 30,000 troops, and they were defeated by about 20,000 English troops. The point is, the war in, in East Asia was about five to 10 times the scale that, that Europe could even imagine creating. And now this is really interesting because not only did this war dwarf the scale of, of European wars. I mean, when, when these guys decide to fight, they could do it on a scale you could not imagine in Europe. They had the logistical, military, organizational capacity to get together hundreds of thousands of soldiers. So when they decided to fight, they could really fight. And yet, in some ways, this is the only war between the three of these for about 12 centuries. There was that world war I told you about at the beginning, you know, in, in Kogryo, when, there was, when we ended up with uh, the sort of unified Korea. And then you get to 1894, 1870, depending on when you want to call, when the Japanese and Chinese began fighting again. And in between, there's only one war. But they clearly could do it. It's not that they couldn't take 100,000 guys and go across water. And so the question must be, why didn't they fight? Or, and that's what I get to, uh, you know, I, I talk a lot more to, in my book. Why didn't they fight more? But also, just the mere fact that there weren't that much more fighting is, is worth noting, especially when we start to compare it to Europe and the incessant invasions between France and Europe. At that time, I actually counted up between 1300 and uh, 1900, there were 43 times that France and England were involved in wars. <laughs> right? uh, so this is, this is actually quite interesting, right? So why? These are old, powerful, organized countries. These aren't just a bunch of scattered tribes and walking around not fighting with each other. And that's in many ways a fascinating type of uh, uh, question. Yes? 